Yeah, you're going to think this is kind of weird. So April Fool's joke was on Windows, and now today I'm doing another Windows video. But this time, this is no joke. Uh, it's, so I'm telling you that up front. So there's no April Fool's joke about this at all. So are you still using Windows 10, um, whether that be Home, Pro, or Enterprise? So what is your plan for support when Windows 10 goes end of life? And that is in October. Actually, the official date is October the 14th in 2025. Officially, Microsoft will pull the plug on security updates, updates of any kind, and support. So you won't be able to call anybody for help uh, from the Microsoft uh, help desk. They're, they won't be there to answer any questions on Windows 10. So if you're still running Windows 10, what are your options? We're going to we're going to explore five options. So that date, uh, Microsoft in the past has, you know, they've come close to that date in the past. And then they said, oh, we'll extend it for a little while and let people have a chance at it. Not this time. It, it seems like they're more emphatic about keeping that date the same. So this isn't just a date on a calendar. It's a significant milestone that impacts millions of users around the world. So what does this mean for you? Well, like I said, it's the end of any security updates, any updates of any any enhancements to the system or any technical system, assistance for Windows 10. So that means, let's just put it in plain language, no patches, no more bug fixes, no support. So you might be wondering why this matters. I mean, it doesn't mean that your system's going to stop working overnight, right? That's right. It doesn't stop working. But the longer you go past that date, the more likelihood that a, a security vulnerability will be detected by someone and there will be no corresponding fix uh, that's coming with it for you to be able to take advantage of, which means that you are operating that machine and that operating system at risk. Now, that is an option, right? You could say, I'm going to ignore this. I'm just going to keep running on it. My, uh, If you do that, then, then I, my suggestion would be to unplug it from the Internet. That means turn off your Wi-Fi, turn off your Ethernet, and, and just run it locally. Does that mean that they'll stop publishing patches to... Uh, Defender? From what I hear, yes. So that's not really a good idea. So what else could you do? Well, Microsoft has a thing that's called Extended Security Update, ESU. You have to pay for it. It's not free, but you can, you can extend the security updates for your machine up to three years. But don't get all excited. I mean, you, yeah, it's, it's not hard to sign up for it, but they charge for it the charging mechanism they use escalates. So in other words, let's say you're a business customer. And I, I did some calculation on a business version of Windows. You'd be looking at about $61 a year per license, per seat. So if your machines, if you had three licenses for Windows at home, you'd be paying $61 on each one of those. Yeah, it is, there isn't a family plan here, <laughs> and that is a subscription model. That only protects you for one year. The second, when you go to renew it for your second year, you're, you're not going to be paying $61. It goes up double. It doubles in price. So now you're at $122 a year. And when you, and if you don't do anything and you, and you wait for the third year for it to renew, it goes up three times your original cost. So now you're looking at $183 a year uh, for that third year. But you can see that you've just paid $61 plus $122 plus or $183. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's getting expensive, isn't it? So, and then once you get to the fourth year, you're out of luck. You can't upgrade anymore and your support drops off. Uh, no security updates, nothing. You're on your own. So you're right back to where you started from. Uh, if if it's just buying you some time, and that's all that that's going to do for you, it's, it's just going to 
allow you some time to maybe save up for a new machine or do something around those lines. Okay, so what else can you do? The third thing you could do, this is number three, you could upgrade from Windows 10 to Windows 11. Now, right now, that's a free upgrade, but Windows 11 is not a straightforward thing because Windows 11 brings along with it some hardware implement, uh, implications because it has very strict uh, hardware requirements. So there's a, there's a piece of software that's out on their site that you can download if you're running Windows 10. You can run it. It will look at your hardware and it'll determine if your hardware is, is compatible with Windows 11 or not. So if it isn't, then you'll need to upgrade the components that it's indicating you're missing. Probably, uh, if you have, so let's start with what those are. So first of all, you need a 64-bit processor that is on the Microsoft list of compatible CPUs, and that's on their website. So yeah, so you can easily check yours to see if it makes that particular cut. The next thing is you need a minimum of four gigabytes of RAM. And I say, oh yeah, that'll run your system. No, it won't. That's just enough to bring up Windows. <laughs> it's not enough to do anything. So if yeah, if you want to run apps, then you're going to have to put additional memory on it. Uh, so eight gig will work. Sixteen gig will work better. <laughs> so yeah, you're most of the. Most of the guys that I know that do games are, are doing 32 gig and up for that. So, yeah, you can, you can, you need to size the system accordingly. Don't go by what your system is going to take for Windows 10 because the footprint for Windows 11 is different. Uh, the other thing is, is that you'll need at least 64 gig of Frida space in order to install the upgrade in the first place. And so, and, and that is the minimum that Microsoft recommends that you have uh, for the amount of storage to be able to have enough room for Windows 11 and all of its features. The next component you'll need is a graphics card or a, a graphics support in the processor. So there are, today, I mean, it used to be that was a big deal, but now, no, it isn't really all that big a deal. That graphics processor has to support Direct 12, DirectX 12 with the WDDM 2.0 driver support. So if your card is so old, or your processor and you're using the internal one, the internal graphics uh, uh, processor, yeah, you could have a problem there. So again, I would suggest go run the utility. It'll look at your system and tell you what's going on with it. The next thing, your Windows 11 requires the UEFI firmware in order for it to build a secure boot. This is a security feature that helps protect your PC from malware and other threats when it starts up. Last, your, your PC will also need to have a TPM. That needs to be version 2. Now, you can easily add one of those on. Most of the boards have TPM slots, uh, and that is a security feature that allows it to manage encryption keys and that just provides another layer of security for your data. Now, you're going to hear people tell you, oh, you can get around all those things. I'm running Windows 11 on a, on a, hard, on a machine that's 10 years old. Yeah, you can do that, but listen to me carefully here. Microsoft has talked about this pretty openly. So first of all, if you have a problem with your machine, it gets infected, and you're coming to Microsoft for support, and they find out you're running hardware that doesn't meet the spec of Windows 11, bye. We're done talking to you that, yeah, it might look good, and you might be able to do stuff until you get into trouble, and then you're screwed. But if you're able to fix all those problems yourself, maybe it's not a big deal, but this is the thing that we used to run into all the time. Uh, I remember with Sun uh, way back when, when if they uh, if you call for support, they would go into the machine and, and they had access to it via uh, a uh, maintenance port that was on the back. 
and they would look at the machine, and if they found that you had hooked up memory that wasn't in there, it wasn't sun memory, or you hooked up a disk drive that wasn't a sun disk drive, yeah, that was the end of the phone call. They'd be like, uninstall that and then call us back if you still have the problem. Transitioning to Windows 11 is a pretty big step. So that's not to be taken lightly, and you need to understand what the all of that entails before you make a decision. Uh, it's a whole new world of computing, and while that's exciting and all that, it's essential to make sure that your machine is up to the task and that you're not going to run into issues down the road. Option number four. You, I've heard people say this, so I'm going to mention it. This is not something I am recommending, but there are people that are saying, oh, just go to Chrome OS Flex. Okay, uh, you could do that. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about what Chrome OS Flex actually is. It's essentially an operating system that's designed by Google based on Linux. It's specifically aimed at running on hardware with lower spec. Uh, a lot of people, you, you know, they usually say that these are machines that are under a hundred dollars. No, <laughs> no, no, it's machines that are under four hundred dollars. But yeah, they're generally not the uh, the highest performance machines out there. But so, but this it is a remarkable operating system. I have covered it, and uh, you can look at the video. Whoop, this side, the video here. To, uh, to look at that if you want and, and decide if Chrome OS Flex is for you. What are the drawbacks? Everything we do in the technology world has pluses and minuses, right? So while Chrome OS is efficient and it's an innovative solution, but it's kind of important that you realize that not all hardware is compatible with Chrome OS Flex. So just because your hardware worked okay with Windows 10 doesn't mean it's going to work on Chrome OS Flex. It could be a nightmare if you're going down the, uh, the incompatibility path. So that may be an option for you. Last thing to consider, again, is not, I mean, say this carefully so that you get this. This may not be for everyone. So don't get mad at me. Uh, for, I'm just bringing options to the table, and this one is a viable option coming from Windows 10. Linux is a free and open source operating system. There isn't any licensing. There's no hidden Microsoft tax to use it. Uh, you can buy machinery today, uh, laptops and desktops both, that have Linux pre-installed on them. Uh, yes, and there are a number of manufacturers that sell uh, uh, complete systems with Linux running on it. Uh, it'll run on a variety of hardware, including older machines that may not meet the requirements for Windows 11. We, Linux doesn't, it will, you can use TPM 2.0, you can use UF, UEFI for your secure boot, but it doesn't require it. That's up to you if you want to turn it on or not. If you don't, that's fine. It'll still work. So yeah, we don't, we don't jam things down our users' throats and say, you must do this. You can run a selection of Windows programs on Linux using Wine. Wine produces a list of packages, of, of different software packages that are commercial, in fact, in some cases, that will run on Linux using Wine. Wine isn't you know, an emulator, so it isn't going to slow down the way the application runs. It's just a translator. Migrating to Linux may be a viable option, uh, particularly if you are curious and you don't mind learning new things. Uh, but if you're set in your ways, you want the world to work like Windows does, then Windows 11 is probably your only path. So I will, I'm, uh, for those of you who are interested in, in the Linux option, look for an upcoming series of videos. I've, I've got a bunch of them I've done in the past, so what I'm going to do is refresh those, bring them up to date, and, and then present them in the steps that you need to go through, the things that I would go through if I was making this move, this transition from Windows. We've covered an awful lot of ground today, so let's take a moment and let's just summarize the, the five different things you can do. One, you could stay the course and just run the machine as is with no patches. Bad idea. Second is you can go the ESU, the extended security update. Uh, that is a short-term thing. It's not permanent. You can't pay for it forever. It's good for up to 
three years from the date that the product goes end of life, which in this case will be three years from October the 14th, 2025. That means that on October the 14th, 2028, you're right back here where you started. The, the next thing is you can transition to Windows 11, but that may mean you're going to have to buy hardware in order to support it. If you've bought a machine recently, chances are you're good, especially if it's like a laptop or a, one of the modern desktops, you're probably fine. But if you've got older hardware, you know, you you need to run the 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 utility and see if you're good to go or not. The other the, the next the next one, you can go to Chrome OS Flex. So, and then finally the last step is if 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 you want to consider it, you can move to Linux. It's another option for you. One thing I do want to cover before we're done here today is what about Windows 12? So, most of the, the things we know about Windows 12 right now are rumors. So just take all of this with a gigantic grain of salt. But so far, what I have learned is that it is possible that Windows 12 could drop this summer. It is very possible that that could happen. There have been some noises being made that Windows 12 will be will will be announced in summer. Originally, they were talking about Windows 12 being released sometime in 2030. That's ridiculous. Why would you even talk about it if it was that far out? You know, it's just, no, I don't think so. All these choices are available to you, and the key is to understand your options with each of them. Make an informed decision about what's best for you and your family. Don't rely on just my advice. Go listen to other YouTubers and other reviewers and l listen to what they have to say, too. They may have ideas that I haven't thought of. I might have ideas they haven't thought of. So, yeah, together that will help you create the best informed decision. So, with that, I'm DJ Ware, and this has been the Cyber Gizmo. And um, thank you to my sponsors. Thank you so much for your support. And thank you to my Patreon members and also the channel members. And I hope to see you again in the next video. Bye for now.